Greetings, Ohio Valley. This is Dan Lima with OSU Extension from Belmont County. And this is Karen Cox from WVU Extension in Ohio County. Thanks for tuning in to Extension Calling, your source for research-based information for the farm, garden, and home. Greetings, Karen. Hey there, Dan. We are back again. Back again, and it's really spring this time. (laughs) It's not only spring, it's like April spring. Right? It's April spring. (laughs) And it's like, we've already had an 80 degree day. And for those of you who are celebrating Easter this week, happy Easter. Happy Easter. Lots of chocolates too. (laughs) (laughs) And you know, a lot of people associate rabbits with Easter, but we're going to take it one step back today and we are going to talk about carrots. Oh, I thought we were talking about rabbit eggs. (laughs) (laughs) I loved those big, commercials. Big misconception, right? <laughs> let's, let's, let's not. For all the little kids listening in, I hate to burst your bubble, but rabbits don't lay eggs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. But yeah, we wanted to talk about carrots because, well, A, the April Garden Calendar article is about carrots, talking about that not all carrots are orange. In fact, the first domesticated carrots were white and purple. Well, it makes sense. We, you know, we breed certain traits into our vegetables. And, you know, if you look, most tap roots like radishes and such are white. A lot of things are also purple. And that has to do with a pigment called anthocyanins. You find that in turnips and you find that in, uh, in beets. Um, so, so really anthocyanins and just no pigmentation at all is pretty common for a lot of root vegetables. Right. And those anthocyanins are great because they delay cellular aging and they can help prevent the formation of blood clots. They can also help with muscle recovery and can inhibit the development and progression of some types of cancer. So, you know, those purple and red dyes in that not dyes but pigments secondary metabolites <laughs> <laughs> yeah so some people refer to them as phytochemicals phyto meaning plants and chemicals meaning chemicals so so phytochemicals um some people consider them secondary metabolites because they're kind of offshoots of primary metabolism with like amino acids and such like like that but you know, and this is what we talk a lot about in botany is, uh, you know, these pigments, pigments and colors help protect the plant. We, a lot of times they act as antioxidants because they help dissipate excess energy that leads to oxygen radicals and cause damages. But the plants need to do that because they're just always in the sun, right? So the thought process is if I'm getting hot, and the sun's burning my skin, I can move indoors. Well, a plant can't move. So it's evolved to produce all these chemicals that help dissipate energy. Some even act like sunscreen. But when we consume these products, these chemicals, they also act the same way in our bodies and they can have a lot of health benefits. So that's why colors are good. (laughs) Yeah, that's why you need to get like five colors on your plate and get yourself all those different nutrients that are out there. Natural colors, right? Not Skittles? (laughs) Not Skittles, no. Sorry, these do not count as a uh, healthy uh, part of your diet. (laughs) But so, yeah, so we wanted to talk about carrots because, you know, the soil is warming up and the sun's warming up, but the soil is still nice and cool, which is when it is great to plant carrots yeah carrots family apac i think i said that right but they are a cool season vegetable right so it is something that we can actually go out there and plant now so for those of you that just built some raised beds and you're just dying to beat the weeds in there (laughs) you know and not wait till may carrots are a great option another good option now is lettuce You, you actually Maybe even are a little behind, but not necessarily like you've missed a boat. <laughs> but, well, lettuce uh, is something that you can sow, you know, regularly too, you know, until it gets really warm. Yeah. Is it, uh, Jefferson, I believe, said that you should plant a thimble full of lettuce every week for a good healthy table. So, you know, <laughs> it's that weekly planting. A, a thimble full of lettuce. That's a lot of lettuce. Well, he did have a lot of people. 
Jefferson liked his veggies. <laughs> <laughs> but carrots, another great veggie. Um, you know, this one actually, so it's like I was saying, it's uh, APAC, which is nice. Um, you know, when we talk about crop rotations, this is one that you can rotate through the Solanaceae. So it's just a, as a reminder, potatoes, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant are all the same family. Mm-hmm. So not the best rotation, but this is one that can break that uh, solid AC rotation. And you can plant now germination temperatures from 45 to 85. So it doesn't like it very hot. So you want to start direct sowing now. Yeah. And also um, while we're on the topic of temperature, if you've ever had a, like a bitter carrot that didn't have a really good flavor, typically that's because it was too warm in the later stages of its development. And so that is what can often create that undesirable flavor. And it also makes the roots a little more coarse. So they're not as not as nice to eat. But if you have really cool temperatures, you know, like prolonged 55 degrees or or so, the roots are going to try to go deeper to get more protection from that cold. So they're going to be more slender and they might even be more pale than you would expect them to be. So the favorite temperature for carrots, they like between 60 and 70 degrees. That's their ideal temperature. So once we start getting into those warmer temperatures in the summer, now I know it was 85 here last week, but you know, we're just going to not talk about that. And they germinate at 45. Mm-hmm. So even in those cool days, they'll still get ahead of things. So you can, you can sow these seeds. And Karen and I were talking about this earlier. Carrots have a tap root. You know, that's what we eat. They go fairly deep and they like really loose soil. And so when we talk about soil textures, there's sand, there's loam, and there's clay. Silt, excuse me. S- silt. I always say loam when I mean silt. <laughs> But like, so yeah, the textures are sand, silt, and clay, and you can get combinations of those to make certain things like loam. Silty clay loam. (laughs) You just kind of mix them up. Yeah, loam is one of those weird, (laughs) but it's, um, but it likes it more in the sandy side of things, right? Because sand is very large, of course, doesn't really hold a lot of water nutrients, But it also doesn't really compact. Right. It's very hard to compact sand. And I and if Karen agrees with me here, then I think we're on to something because (laughs) I like I I joke around and I say it's impossible to compact sand (laughs) unless you make concrete out of it, I guess. Well, yeah, unless you add clay, right? (laughs) Yeah. And we were talking about that. That's one of the things in this region, you know, we have we have clay soil and that's really not the best soil for growing carrots because any type of a root crop where you want that root to be nicely formed and to grow large, if it's the soil is tight and won't let the root expand easily, then you often have deformed vegetables that don't get very big or they split. So if you have tried to grow carrots and they're always weirdly shaped or they're forked, a lot of times that's because there's either too many rocks in the soil or because the soil's not loose enough. So if you have a clayey soil and you really want to grow beautiful carrots, I recommend a raised bed uh, where you're installing a nice fluffy soil that doesn't get compacted. Yeah. And so for planting purposes, if you do want to try it on the soil type that you have try it here's another beauty of it you can actually get 16 plants per square foot but the typical spacing for carrots is one seed every inch and the rows are going to be two feet apart so 24 inches so every inch you're putting in a seed and then once once they get larger, you thin them out to every other. So you get two inches between the plants. But even at that level, you're getting quite a bit of plants in a small area. Yeah. And if you're doing square foot gardening, you don't have that two foot spacing between your rows. You're doing that one inch on a square foot basis. You can pack in carrots fairly tight, but they do need to get full sun. 
And the more important thing is they need to get even moisture. That is really critical for carrots, which is frustrating because when you want to put them in a sandier soil that drains faster and doesn't retain water like our clay soils, then you have to irrigate more often because the water is going to flow right through. And if carrots dry out, they are unhappy. Yeah. And that's something you're going to struggle with in a lot of raised beds because the idea of the raised bed is you increase drainage and you alleviate the compaction potential by having it raised and not stepping on it too. But yeah, it does take a lot of irrigation. And even though sometimes it feels like it rains every day, when we when we get to the summer, even though it still might think you, it still feels like it rains every day, it doesn't. Um, and, you know, you're going to have to have some kind of irrigation there. But as far as preparation and planting goes, we were saying carrots grow best in deep, loose, well-drained. It can be mineral or organic soils. We were talking about organic matter as being kind of the principal ingredient, making it less compacted. Organic matter will do that. So compost is going to be your friend with carrots or sand, you know, and that would be more on the mineral side of things. But don't just add sand to your garden outside because you don't want to just throw sand into a clay soil because that's not a recipe for good drainage. What you do want to add if you have a clay soil is lots of that, like Dan was saying, lots of that organic matter. And another thing you can do is when you have planted your seeds, you can cover those seeds with either vermiculite or a fine sifted compost so that the little babies can get through it easily. But that'll also help to keep the soil evenly moist. Yeah. And irrigation wise, real critical to keep that topsoil moist as the plants are growing, because you're going to have that, you know, the the roots not going to go very deep, but as that plant matures now and you have some surface dryness, that tap root is going deep. So you're going to be a little safer as far as forgetting to irrigate (laughs) because you're going to have that deeper root and that moisture is going to be deeper in the flat, in the um, flower bed, the, the raised bed garden. So it won't be as critical to make sure that everything is moist all the way through, I guess, is the best way to look at it. Yeah. And, you know, we one of the things we skipped when we were talking about soil is the pH. So carrots really don't like a uh, really acidic soil. There's another strike against just putting them out in the regular garden here, unless you have um, limed and maintained it with a good balance. But they like that a- ideal vegetable pH range of 6 to 6.8. Mm-hmm for your best results on carrots. I'm not saying they won't grow in an acidic soil. They just won't be as nice. Yeah, and not not typically seen too much, honestly. Like carrots are kind of, like we were saying, they this isn't the best area for them. And in fact, you know, when I'm looking at the crop profiles of carrots in Ohio, we can see that the northwest part of the state is where we see most of the, uh, the carrots grown. Henry, Fulton, Hardin, a lot of carrots growing that way. And that sandy muck soil, that's why. It's got that loose or high organic matter sandy soil. It's like the perfect recipe for a deep taproot crop like carrots. So they're growing a lot in the northwest part of the state, also in the northeast and Ashtabula and those areas that have a lot of muck soils as well. Uh, but they do have insect pests and some of the major ones that they'll have are the aster leaf hoppers wire worms and carrot weevils so you you'll notice that these aren't the typical insects that we talk about when we talk about tomatoes and peppers because you know this is a different family and this is the idea so one of them the the aster leaf hopper can overwinter so by planting something else there it breaks that cycle so that's how you have to look at crop rotation and uh, plant families. But the aster leaf hopper is a big one. It overwinters in eggs in Ohio, but there are migrating leaf hoppers as well. And what they do is they uh, feed damage on the actual plants, so the leaves and the flowers as well. But they can bring diseases like mycoplasma and stuff into the carrot, and that can ruin, ruin your crop. 
Yeah. And root knot nematodes are also an issue with carrot production. And you're going to get a lot of those when you're rotating into a garden area out of a grassy field for the first time. So whenever you are transitioning from turf to to a garden bed, to a vegetable production, you really want to avoid those root crops for that first year because there are going to be nematodes in that soil that we're used to hanging out in the grasses and they'll jump right into your root crops. So I do recommend avoiding a root crop right after you're converted a garden bed from turf or from pasture or hay or whatever. Another one is the carrot weevil. You know, that's another major pest of carrots. Carrot weevil... It's a weevil, dark brown beetle, quarter inch long, and it's got that little snout that once you see it, you'll be able to recognize it like always and everywhere. But they also overwinter. Weevils are so cute. <laughs> unless you're growing carrots, then you're, yeah, it just does, doesn't look so cute when you're, when it's a nuisance. No, that's true, but they still are cute. I don't care. <laughs> they got those long schnozzes. <laughs> they do. They do. They call them short snouts here, but, you know, for a bug, it's pretty big. <laughs> they overwinter as they overwinter and plant debris and things like that. So, again, you can break that cycle with crop rotation. Mm-hmm. And they emerge in May and begin to deposit eggs, two to four eggs in small holes and the petioles of the tops of the roots. So they're going to basically like right at the crown, like where you're going to have the root stem division. They're laying their eggs and then you're going to have these larvae that are going to hatch one or two weeks after that. So emerge in May, deposit the eggs. A couple weeks later, you got the larva and you have a pretty, you got like almost a two month old carrot. And then you got these larvae digging down Mm -hmm. and those will feed on the roots. And that's sadness. So those are feeding on the good stuff, you know, the stuff that we're eating. And, you know, they're going to put holes in it. Then pathogens are going to come in it and it's going to not be pleasant. But again, keep focusing on that rotation and that's going to help you out a lot. So, yeah, including carrots in your uh, rotation with your Solanacea crops and your cucurbit crops. Keep rotating things around. And if you have a small garden, you just have one small raised bed, work with your neighbors and see if you can't share crops. So your neighbor's going to grow tomatoes this year and you're going to grow carrots and lettuce. And then you guys just share the bounty together. And then the next year you flip back into, or, you know, two years later, you flip back into growing tomatoes and you're sharing your tomatoes with your neighbor and they're growing the carrots and the lettuce. And, you know, it's a great way to build that sense of place and build camaraderie in your community. But also it's a great way to protect your crops and to keep them from those diseases and insect problems that proliferate when you grow the same thing every year. Yeah, and get this, because you're planting carrots so early, mm-hmm. you know, we're talking about the growing season, of course, you can actually start harvesting them as early as July, and you can harvest them into October. And here's another nice thought. So you got your carrots going, right? So you're getting you're getting a crop out of it. And if you're harvesting in July, you got plenty of time for like a second crop beans and cucumbers and eggplants and okra, peppers, southern pea, squash, sweet corn, tomatoes. And if it's if it's early July, you can even get sweet potatoes, pumpkins and muskmelons in there, which were all different families, right? So we talk about that rotation, you know, you could start with carrots and with tomatoes or if you're kind of pushing it later into August, In August, you can do things like you can still do cucumbers, still do squash. You can get beans in there. You can get some short season sweet corn or like, yeah, short season sweet corn, broccoli. But it's mainly like the cool season at this point, right? Because even though it's August, they're going to be growing the most in September, October. So that's where you can get your broccoli, your Brussels sprouts, your cabbage, your collards, lettuce, mustards, turnips. It doesn't necessarily have to be another root crop, but if it is, just by rotating the families, you're still going to be doing a crop rotation kind of uh, cultural method. And hopefully that means for 
less disease. Yeah, uh, rotating within the season is helpful, but you do still have to watch out for those um, annual diseases like leaf spot and blight and things like that. So you do have to still watch for some of those soil-borne diseases. But yeah, it is a form of crop rotation, and so that can be helpful. Especially when you're looking at these root crops, one of the biggest complaints I get for people trying to grow carrots successfully is weed competition. And weed control in carrots is really essential in getting a good, healthy crop because they get such a slow start on that top because as a root crop, it really wants to focus on getting that root established. And so you can get weed encroachment that comes in really, really fast. So you really want to make sure that you are doing everything you can to prevent. So you want to make sure that you are using a area, a soil that doesn't have a lot of weeds to start with. Nut sedge is a huge problem with carrot crops because it does have that rhizome that if you split it, you get two type of thing. And that's really frustrating because you want to may have light, fluffy soil. And so if you have nut sedge in there and you till it, well, then you have more nut sedge in there. And a lot of the chemicals that are available for control, you can't use when you're growing a food crop. And so you really want to make sure that you've taken care of any of these really aggressive weeds before you plant your crop. And you can do that by solar sterilization of the soil where you put clear plastic down over the winter months and let the sun beat down on it for a little while and that can help to kill any of the weed seeds that are in there. Uh, It can also help to control some of those nematodes and whatnot. But after you've planted them, you want to use a You can either use row cover or plastic row cover or landscape fabric and plant, cut little holes in it and plant directly into those holes so that that's the only place a plant can come up. Or you can add, after they have come up and you've identified them, you can add a thin layer of mulch in between them so that you can further suppress any other plants from coming up. So weed control is a challenge and You'll probably want to get out there really early on and make sure that you're pulling out any competitors. Yeah, I know. Another thing is the sooner you can get it out there, because even though we do have weeds now, we even talked about some great weeds to have in the orchard last week. (laughs) Remember the purple dead nettle? It's out there. Mm -hmm. Along with other things, weeds are starting to become a problem. But yeah, carrots are a small seed. And it's hard to transplant carrots because we've talked about that delicate taproot and everything. Mm -hmm. The nice thing about transplanting is that you can get ahead of the weeds because you got a three inch plant, you know, just after a weed cleanup. So weeds are usually for most crops, a problem as far as light penetration, you know, you, as long as you're above the weeds, sometimes it's fine. You know, we're talking about corn and things like that. But when you're talking about roots, the, if you have a weed with a, large tap root and there's plenty out there the dandelion is one it's a great example hmm. kind of almost looks like a carrot root right but when you're talking about space underneath the soil and we're also discussing how delicate uh, that carrot tap root is as it grows you know it can't really it starts morphing when it hits something so if you got a lot of weed com- competition even the parts you can't see, that ca- that tap root's not going to develop very well because it's bumping in everything else. Mm-hmm. So not only do you have a light penetration problem, but you're also going to have like the underground root development competition as well. So you keep it clean, but it is a tough crop because you're you're always going to start from seed, pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I would do want to throw this weed problem out there because the leaves are very, very similar and that's poison hemlock. And when you are growing things that have a similar leaf shape, it's really important to look closely when you're pulling weeds. If you see any of your carrot leaves that have purple splotches on the stems, granted, poison hemlock is going to get much bigger. Yeah. And they're like seven feet tall. <laughs> yeah. But when they're first coming up and they, you know, that first year and they're in that rosette, it's not as as clear. And there's a lot of cases where people have gone out foraging and they are foraging wild carrots and they pull up and the, ca- the taproot looks just like a carrot and they take a bite. And 
I'm sorry, but that's really not a good idea if you're not absolutely positive of what you are picking in the wild. Yeah. Because poison hemlock is just that. It is poisonous and it will kill you. No ifs, ands, or buts. I mean, there, there's you have a very, very short window. Yeah between getting some some treatment in the emergency room and, and not surviving that experiment. So poison hemlock looks a lot like a wild carrot, but again, those purple splotches on the leaves, it has a white taproot. Don't eat that, okay? <laughs> and, and watch for it popping up in your carrot beds and, um, and get rid of it with gloves. Yeah. Um, and, and it's a biannual, so it has two life cycles. It's got that vegetative even before it bolts up. But that would be a terrible thing. Yeah, just poison hemlock, purple stem, a lot larger than carrots, but actually could be a problem if you're moving soil from ditches into a raised bed. But yeah, that would be a terrible mistake. Hey friends, we need your help. In order to help keep this show going, we need to hear back from you. Please take some time and check out our evaluation. You can either contact us directly for a copy, or you can go online to https colon forward slash forward slash bit dot ly forward slash. Here's the tricky part. Capitalize the next three words. Extension, calling, evaluation. Again, extension, calling, and evaluation all need to be capitalized. So bit.ly forward slash extension calling evaluation. Give us your thoughts. Let us know if you like the show. And especially, let us know if you've used any of the information you've gained from our show. Once again, you can reach us directly. You can call Karen at 304-234-3673. That's 304-234-3673. Or you can reach Dan at 740-695-1455. That's 740-695-1455. Let us know how you use the information that you get from this show, whether it is change in your shopping habits, a change in your gardening, or simply just expanding your mind. We want to know. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for listening to Extension Calling. This show is a collaboration between OSU Belmont County Extension Educator Dan Lima and WVU Ohio County Extension Agent Karen Cox. If you'd like a transcript of this show, contact us at the office. Also, let us know if you enjoy the show by ranking us on your podcast app.